crime being up in Louisville, but that's hardly unique. Crime was up in Atlanta, where you previously worked for 25 years. Uh, crime is up in Washington. Crime is up in virtually every big city. Shootings, homicides, up. Uh, recently, you noted that homicides rose 92% in Louisville last year, and they're on the rise now. I think you've had 104 so far this year, uh, when the total for last year was 170. What? Why is this happening? Uh, after so many years of declines, I mean, we used to see these stats steadily going down year after year. What has what started to change in 2020, and which has continued into 2021? No, and I appreciate that because I think you're asking the right question, and that is, what is different? Because if you're going to find the solution, you've got to figure out where's the aberration. And when I look at Louisville, it's similar to when I police in Atlanta, uh, in Georgia, and that is, first off, in the southern states where you have very lax gun laws, it does lend itself to a high proliferation of illegal weapons on the street. So that's already in place. You layer on top of that, there is there is a COVID component to it, certainly. Um, individuals who were already marginalized um, were further set off to the side, um, in particular when you talk about juveniles. Um, if you have young people who do not have stability in their lives, very often that the sanctuary is the school, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and all of that is removed. Now you have a bunch of children that just have, they don't, they don't have any, any place to be or anything to do or purpose. So now we've in, uh, we have the illegal guns, we have uh, kids with a bunch of idle time on their hands. Um, we have a real backlash um, against policing, which in turn has prompted what you're seeing is in many areas, and I really am experiencing this firsthand in, in uh, Louisville, is a reluctance by the officers to self-initiate activity and to be proactive. It's not that they're anti-community or they don't want to do the job, to be clear. This is not something that should be associated with blue flu, flu or striking. It's really, um, last year put them in a mental space where they are not sure the community wants them to police. They're concerned that if they're involved in a use of force, they will be immediately stigmatized. There'll be protesters in front of their house. Um, and they're also acutely aware of, given the volume of guns that are on the street, they may have to use force. So what the, the market difference that you're seeing is, one is the removal of services for kids, and two, it's police who are reactive. And the only way you deter crime is if you are you insert yourself in it as a cop and disrupt it ahead of time, and that's that has not been occurring. Well, you you touched on about five different things I'd plan to ask you about. Let's go first to proactive okay. policing. Uh, you've talked about how that's crucial, uh, and so last month you launched executive team engagement to get your commanders out into the community to encourage proactive policing. I think you've been out there too. So how's that gone? What what have you learned? I think it's only been three or four weeks that you've been doing this, but how's that gone for you so far? So, you know, previously, if you had, you know, I think as a chief, you always have to you figure out what the issue is that you are facing. There's similar similarities for sure between jurisdictions, but the issues I have here are very different than the ones I had in Atlanta, quite honestly. Here, what I encountered was officers just were not confident, are not confident that the command leadership, the administration, the community, the city council will support them. And so there's a real reluctance, a real hesitancy to, to step forward and step out. Um, on top of that, layer on top of that, uh, this high volume of resignations. And so what I realized is lacking is just a, a true belief in the commanders that we will fight for them and say, no, what they did, they had to do. And no amount of messaging that I was putting forward was going to resolve that as much as saying to the executive team, put on the bulletproof vest, get the radio, and we're gonna go out and we're gonna patrol with these folks. And so we pulled details um, and people from, and what we're doing is we're pulling across um, all of the divisions, all eight divisions, because it's important to me that 
that the message start to, to make it through the different parts of the uh, county and the uh, city. And we pulled together this detail, the executive command, myself included, we were, were policing with them um, so that they see firsthand that, no, we, we do understand how difficult this job is. We do understand the decision making you're having to do. For me, it was, it's been a great opportunity to get to see firsthand how many guns are on the street. So we've done the detail in the last two weeks. We've done the detail five times. We've seized 26 guns. And those are just the guns that, you know, that people didn't drive off with legally. And it was very interesting to me just the first night. It's like you see it, you, you hear it all the time, but seeing firsthand some of the weaponry we were coming across, it was really, it was really unsettling. Um, and so it's been very good. Uh, we need to continue in it. But I don't, I don't think it's coincidental that the first, we, we had been hitting homicides. It was almost, it felt like every night, unfortunately. And we started the details and we went eight days without a homicide. And I, I directly believe that that was a result of the engagement shown by the officers. And I'm, I'm really appreciative of it. 